Great. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, this is another edition of uh, the online time series seminar. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Toru Kitugawa joining us from uh, Brown uh, slash UCL. And he's joined by his co-authors, Wei Ning Wang and Meng Chung Shu, who are also uh, in the panel. Um, Toru, you have one hour. Um, looking forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us. OK, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Uh... Thank you, all the organizers, for, for having me here. So this is a joint work with a Wayne in one and mentioned Shu. So they are here for uh, as a panelists. OK, so this paper is about the time series uh, and some policy making. Here, they, they're using some techniques developed in the micro econometrics setting. So now that we are trying to bring ideas and techniques to time series policy setting. Okay, right. So then, the, the, since many of you have studied economics, so I hope you agree on some claim that you know the one of the goals of economics is to inform better policy. And uh, in micro econometric setting, setting the yeah the how to make use of causal inference or treatment effect or program evaluation, how to make use of that for policy design. That has been an active area of research. Uh, I think that this kind of questions and framework uh, have been proposed. Uh, say that, yeah, the first paper, I think, is Chuck Mansky's 2004 Econometrica. So he formulated this question of using causal inference for policy decision making, now using the framework of statistical decision theory. Yeah. And uh, this literature has been growing these days, and uh, but mainly focusing on micro econometric context. In the microeconometric context, the question is how to allocate these individual level treatments to maximize social work. So the main question of this paper is, okay, now how can we think about this policy decision making in the time series setting where the available data are kind of aggregated level mark kind of time series? Yeah. So that here I'm listing up kind of examples, which hope we hope you know, eventually we can work out. But the, for instance, the, yeah, FOMCs, the data-driven policy choice about interest rate. They want to set high interest rate, low interest rate. They want to increase the interest rate or, or lower the interest rate based upon available data. And here, yeah, if they have some very defined welfare criteria, now use data to inform welfare optimal policy. So that kind of question can be analyzed in a framework we are, we are proposing today. Also, this is the application we are looking at in, our, in, the, in the talk. So this is about policy choice of relaxing or tightening some containment policy during pandemic time. So having observed some policies or outcomes in the past, now the governments want to decide whether to relax or not this, uh, the, yeah, like lockdown policy, for instance. Yeah. So those are also like policy decision making where the available data are aggregated time series. Okay, the goal of my talk today is okay, I want to develop a framework of a statistical policy choice in a time series, and then we are going to propose data-driven decision rules and characterize its welfare performance. So that's the goal. So here's my out, the outline of my talk today. So I'm spend some time. To, to review the literature of statistical treatment choice, because here the, the, the framework and kind of the, the perspective is coming from the micro econometric setting. So I first want to give some review on that. And after that, yeah, I'm going to extend the, this framework of treatment choice to time series setting. And I'm going to be clear about what kind of challenges, what kind of questions yeah, we have to solve. Yeah. And uh, yeah, to, to, to develop this framework, we are going to rely on the recent the framework of potential outcome time series developed in these uh, literatures. So these literatures offer a very flexible way of talking about causal effects in the time series setting. So we are going to use that. Then the, the third, yeah, the, we, we look at some toy example, which is really, really toy example, but that we can learn a lot of insights from there. And we can see some basically main results yeah, most clearly in this toy example. So I will probably yeah, try to cover this toy examples kind of 
uh, thoroughly. Yeah, and if time left, yeah, I'm going to generalize and uh, give an empirical illustration. So those are the outcomes. Okay. Right. So here's the the review of the the micro econometric setting of treatment choice. So typical setting is here that planner or econometrician, so they have access to the randomized control trial data, RCT data. And in this data, the, the, we observe here individual subscript, I is an individual, so individual level of pre-treatment pre covariance, something like education or previous earnings. So this is the experimental data, so treatment has been already randomized. So there's a binary treatment, either zero or one, yeah, like job training program. In the data, we see post-treatment outcome, which is like employment or income. So this data is given. Now the planner wants to come up with a policy. Here in the micro setting, the open the policy is having I mean, upon observing, upon observing the individual's characteristics X, planner wants to decide whether to give the treatment or not. So this G is a function of individual's characteristics map into either one or zero. Yeah. Uh, well, since this is a binary map, right? The, we can also view this G as a function here, yeah, indicate a function such that individual characteristics X is belonging to some subset G. Here, G is in the space of characteristics. So we want to partition this space of characteristics into the region G, which we are going to recommend the treatment, G complements, yeah, which we do not recommend treatment. So how to partition this space of characteristics into two regions. So that's the policy. Yeah. Now the, here, the, this is like basic definition of welfare, or I mean, simple definition of welfare, which the, the literature often looks at. So here, yeah, the additive welfare. So now that if policy G is implemented in this population of individuals, the yeah, individuals who get treated will have a Y of one. Individuals who will not be treated okay, will have Y of zero. Right? Those are potential outcomes, yeah? Y of one, Y of zero. So now Prana wants to maximize the average level of Y. So that, the, yeah, so this is a welfare criteria, policy G. And then Prana wants to maximize this welfare criteria over policies. So that's the policy goal. <clears throat> right, and then the, here the, 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 the statistical treatment choice literature basically now talks about how to come up with this policy G in a data driven way. So now given the data, well, given the data, yeah, so this is the experimental data. Now the econometricians of Prana process this data to come up with a certain policy recommendation, G hat. So this depends upon data. Yeah. Now this policy is going to be implemented to the population where the data have been drawn. And then as if this jihad is implemented here, then the, as a payoff, we get social welfare, W of jihad. So that's the planner's pay, uh, payoff. Yeah. Now that if you want to talk about optimal way of learning the policy, yeah, what we, what we do care is we want to come up with some way of getting this jihad so as to make this welfare as good as possible. May I ask and a question? Um, uh, please, uh, please. So, so um, are, you, are you ruling out randomization? So observing pretreatment uh, variables and, and then randomizing after that? Uh, so they, right. So they actually, yeah. So here, the, yeah, I'm restricting the policy to- Deterministic. Deterministic. Deterministic uh, means okay. upon observing X, decision is either one or zero. Okay. okay. But of course, yes. we can think about the randomized decisions, meaning conditional, I mean, upon observing X, still we randomize. Mm -hmm. okay. and the, the, with what probability? That, but we are, we, are, we are not concerned in that. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. And the, here, what's important is, okay, so in this figure, what's important is jihad is random, right? Because that depends upon data and data are random. So this welfare, W of G hat, has distribution. Yeah. So we basically want to make this distribution of welfare like as good as possible. Yeah. Want to shift to the right as much as possible. 
And in this way, yeah, we want to come up with an optimal way of learning uh, policy. Okay. So these are cross-sectional set. Yeah. Now you can kind of anticipate it. in the time series setting, what will happen? Well, now data become time series. Yeah. We see the past history of this uh, Y and D and X. Sorry, I'm using W in this paper, sorry. D should be W. Yeah, and then the, now that we are today, using this data, we come up with the today's issues. And then uh, we get some welfare of today's population, which can, can be very different from the past populations where the data are uh, drawn. Right? So, so picture gonna change a lot once you have time series setting. But I'll be more clear uh, on that. Okay, so then the, let me just quickly review what's the known treatment choice rule. Uh, so here, Mansky 2004 econometric paper, he looked at discrete X case, like male or female, just a binary X point, let's say. And then the, he proposed the following way of coming up with G hat. Says that the, here that we're gonna treat the individuals such that tau hat of X, which is an estimate of the conditional average treatment effect given X. So if this conditional average treatment effect, Kate is positive, treat. Otherwise, not to treat. So this defines a set of X's yeah, that should be treated, right? So that's G hat CES. And tau hat of X is obtained through difference in means estimator. Yeah? Uh, well, in the discrete X case, it's very simple to construct such. And just plug in this tau hat of X into the, 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 the so population optimal initial rule. Also something, Innovative in this Mansky's paper is that so Mansky wants to assess the performance of this statistical treatment choice using the welfare welfare regret. So here, the, so this is the population welfare now maximizing over policies. So that's a maximum attainable welfare by this assignment policy G. Yeah. Now subtracting W of G hat CES. So this is estimate, uh, policy constructed upon the data. And this difference is giving the welfare loss, or what we call welfare regret. And that's positive because we don't know optimal, true optimal G, so we are estimating from the data. So there's a mistake there. And that's measured in the positive number here. Since data are random, right? So this has a distribution. And let's look at the mean, mean of this welfare regret distribution. And the Mansky's paper, yeah, the Mansky showed how the upper bound yeah, the finite sample upper bound of this expected welfare regret, and then discusses how this welfare regret upper bound converges to zero, uh, what, at what rate, and so on. So now that that's the discrete X case. Now, if we have more richer set of X, including say continuous X, yeah, then the Estimating tau hat of x by simple difference in means is not quite feasible, right? So then the alternative, well, so then the, in this case, yeah, this EWM, empirical welfare maximization approach, which I developed with Alex Tetanoff in, in the previous paper. So we, yeah, we look at the following approach. It says, well, we start from the class of partitions in the space of x. So now X is a richer set, right? So then, but we can think about how to partition this space of X's, which is denoted as this script G. We want to run about optimal policy out of this script G. So what we could do is we construct sample analog of the population welfare, W hat of G, that maximize this W hat of G over class of policies. We call this as just uh, empirical welfare maximization, maximizing empirical welfare over class of feasible policies. Well, if we have randomized experimental data, RCT data, we can construct empirical analog of the population welfare in this way. So this is a propensity score weighted sum of outcomes in the experimental data. And then we maximize this over class of partitions, G. So this can be viewed as a kind of generalization. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to, to interrupt you. I mean, I'm just trying to see whether, so he, is, the, is the time dimension here 
place any rule in, in picking the, the function G? I mean, what I have in, in my mind is sort of what we do, for example, when we pick the, the, the prediction function, right? And then we try, I mean, you could do it some sort of like out of sample or, and then see, uh, you know, minimizing uh, the one that minimized the, the prediction error. Well, so I'm wondering whether you have like observations uh, so in so terms far, of well, yeah. Right. So so far, the, I I'm looking at the cross section of data, so mm -hmm. no time series yet. Uh, but if we look at the time series setting, now that this i now become time, mm -hmm. and then the yeah we can think about prediction type problem. In this case, instead of having welfare, we may have uh, some prediction loss. Yeah, I mean you yeah. could um, you know. My thinking here is 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 like using the cross section and time series. I'm not sure if that's uh, implementable, but uh, to see whether like the time series can pro pro provide some information about welfare. I mean, in terms of why, and so like looking at someone in the future, whether we made the right decision picking uh, picking that person or not. I mean, oh, in terms I of see, welfare, see, in terms of uh, finding a job or or, or not. Yeah. Well, so the, here the, the, well, okay, so there's one crucial difference between prediction type problem and the causal type problem. Yeah. So in prediction type problem, you know, if we make predictions and after the, you know, the predicted variable realized, we can actually see the loss directly, right? How yeah. much mistake we did, yeah. we can actually see that. But in a causal setting at the individual level, we never be able to see we did the right thing or not because we only observe one of the potential outcomes, never observe the other. I see, but I thought like the time series you have, like, you know, also, you know, you observe the individual across the time and maybe right. you can infer some information about the future of well, that person in 10 years time or 20 years well, time. Sure, yeah. If, if you yeah. make assumption about how the counterfactual outcomes are evolving, if you make yeah. that assumptions, yes, then the weekend, we can say something about the missing potential outcomes. And based okay. upon that, yes, we can argue. But here, yeah, we are not, we don't have such, I mean, any assumptions about yeah, how the, okay. how the counterfactual Thank outcomes are evolving. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Arun, uh, quick uh, clarification question. So mm -hmm. I understand the relationship between uh, maximizing welfare head, which I think is the empirical one, or minimizing the difference, the one you showed before between the hypothetical welfare WDG and yeah, because you mentioned uh, I'm not familiar with Matsky paper. Is there an equivalence? Uh, I mean, this, this one is probably unfeasible because we don't know WDG. Is there an equivalence? What, what's what's best? Or even just maximizing uh, expect the condition activation of Y, which might be the same. Uh, right. Well, so one, as soon as we fix that class of policies here, this G. As far as we fix that, then the yeah the max well maximizing maximizing this W is equivalent to saying that I mean, equivalent to minimizing this regret. So they are the same problem. Okay, so they can be different yeah. if that yeah once we start adding this script G also can. I mean, so we're not trying to we're not trying to fear this WG. We're essentially trying to do our best given what we measure, which is W hat and. And it happens that uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, but basically, how much, how quickly we can attain to the maximum attainable welfare. So that's the something we can, yeah. The yeah, six past get in the bounds. How yeah. close we get? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So then the in the cross section setting, yeah, we maximize this empirical welfare over G, and what's known in the literature is this is an expected welfare regret. Okay, this can converge to zero at the rate one over square root n, n is the sample size, and that this v is a complexity measure of the partitions. Uh, it's a VC dimension. Okay, so then just just to, to indicate how different things are between cross-sectional and time series setting, I just want to, to tell how to kind of basically bound this kind of quantity expectation of the welfare regret. So oh, the, there's some general inequality. So if you look at um, this kind of regret, yeah, this regret can be always bounded by 
two times supremum of W hat minus W. Yes, supremum is over G. So this inequality is generally true. And uh, basically, we want to bound the expectation of this quantity. By expectation bounding this expectation of this quantity is equivalent to, sorry, that it can be bounded by the expectation of the supremum of this W hat minus W. And uh, W hat minus W, so W hat is an unbiased estimator for W. And you can view this W hat minus W is a centered empirical process indexed by this partition G. So the expectation of the supremum of empirical processes, how to bound that is very, very studied in, in, the, in the literature of empirical processes and probability theory. So we use some existing maximal inequality. So inequality to bound expectation of this quantity, you have to, to get this kind of bound. But uh, basically, the, 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 the benchmark setting for this kind of inequality is IID there. Yeah. So in time series, we will have something dependent there. So we have to come up with, I mean, we have to use some inequality which allows for the empirical process of the dependent uh, there. So that's something we will, we will see later. Okay, so far, maybe I can pause for more questions if you have more. Not so basically that's the end of the review of the cross-sectional study. Yeah. Now that I want to talk about the yeah extensions to time series. That's what this paper is about. So yeah, the, let me first uh, list up what are the questions and challenges. First, in a dynamic setting, maybe macro setting, policy impact can have dynamic causal effects. So the policy implemented yesterday might have causal effects today or tomorrow. Also, this dynamic causal effects can be heterogeneous. In the time series setting, heterogeneity means causal effects are different over time. That is basically corresponding to non-stationary. Also, there's something we observe in data, okay, past history, yeah, the policy impact for today or maybe tomorrow, they can be different. So in this sense, yeah, there's a concern about external validity. Those are one big challenge here. And the second, that's a more statistical challenge. So observations are no longer IID. So we cannot really directly apply some tools for IID data. Third, well, in case of micro setting, I think the welfare objective is reasonably well defined. Uh, because population is kind of clear. But in case of the time series setting, not really clear what objective functions we want to optimize. Also, even though we write down the welfare objective, it's not clear how to really come up with the empirical analog using time series data. Which, we, yeah, that's a question which actually we will be more clear about it later. And the fourth, suppose we agree upon writing down the objective functions, uh, suppose we manage to write down the empirical analog and get the policies, then can we actually ensure degree convergence? What condition do we need? Uh, what convergence rate are we going to have? So to our understanding, to our knowledge, so all these questions are open questions. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, in this paper, yeah, basically we try to, 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 to answer uh, those questions. Now let me introduce the potential outcome time series to define the causal effects and also yeah, to define the policy choice in the time series setting. So suppose we have a social planner, yeah, who is at the beginning of time period cap T. And he wants to, he or she wants to perform the policy choice in the beginning of time period T. That's the choice W subscript cap T. So that's the choice. We assume that's binary, either one or zero policy choice. Here, the available information is okay, the planner has access to time series observations. Let's say starting from period zero up to cap T minus one. That's the initial period we conditioned. Yeah? And then that, there's the observations here. So YT, so those are the observed outcome in the data. Yeah, and WT, so that's the treatment, uh, which actually we assume this treatment is observed in the data. And okay, that's manipulatable by the by the policymaker. Yeah. 
Uh, well, in case of a, if you want to view this WT as a kind of policy shock, structural policy shock here, and implicit assumption is yeah, the, the in the data, we actually observe this structural policy shock, which, yeah, that's the assumption. And then the plan now also has access to some exogenous contextual information. Yeah. So now that these are the data set, time series of those are the data set. So yeah, here's a sample, yeah, that's a sample. <clears throat> Now, in order to define the causal effects in a time series setting, so let me define the counterfactual treatment path. I use lowercase w to denote the counterfactual. So that's a sequence, 0, 1 sequence of length t, cap t. Yeah, and the each 0, 1 sequence is corresponding to counterfactual history of these treatments or policies. Yeah. And for each counterfactual, path we can define the potential outcomes. So that would be the outcome that would realize if the actual history realized is this W0 to T. So that's the counterfactual outcome at time period T. So now the, this is the most general setting, but the actually one important key assumption to make analysis manageable is some sort of exclusion restriction. Here we are borrowing the terminology from this Lambert and Shepard paper. Uh, so we assume no anticipating potential outcomes. It says the time, the potential outcome at time period T, it depends only on the policy up to time period T. And the future policies from T plus one to cap T, it, this doesn't give any causal impacts for current time period T. So future policies are excluded in this causal, causal, causal model, potential outcomes. Yeah. So that's one key assumption we impose throughout. And then the observed data okay, is the white is the observed in your data. Okay, that's exactly the one corresponding to the realized policy path. So this is another key also assumption. Uh, just to avoid uh, my own confusion later. So before in the micro illustration, it said um, treatment can be conditional on characteristics and, uh, and, and the policymaker can take into account, I don't know if the guy is sick or not, or tall or short and so on. Well, treatment assignment, treatment assignment. Assignment, assignment, yeah, assignment, assignment, assignment. is a function of it. But in yeah. RCT, RCT setting, the treatments are randomized. Okay, 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 that's yep. true. But now I'm trying to think of the mapping with the with the time series, because because you mentioned the, for instance, the monetary shocks. So I'm kind of biased towards thinking like that. I'm used to thinking of shocks as uh, exogenous, so I cannot kind of. Call, uh, I struggle to think of one type shocks versus conditioning on a certain history or another. Uh, I thought I thought these are kind of exposed, kind of a uh, random variations in an endogenous sphere that we hope exists so that we can actually trace them such an uh, like a, like a causal effect. Do I need to think of shocks? Can I just think of interest rates, high and low interest rates, and that's it? Or is it something I'm, I'm missing? Uh, okay, that's a great question. Well, the, so I think that the, whenever, okay, so in this paper, we always rely on this non-anticipating potential outcome, outcomes, which means basically that the, the uh, Agents in this uh, model, or at least in the data, in the data, the agents okay, they they cannot really anticipate the future policies. Or maybe when we think about yeah, counterfactual policy outcomes, we think about the policy manipulation, which agents cannot really predict. So that if we want to say okay, policy interest rate policy is exactly as the interest rate is high or low, or maybe interest rate structural shock is positive or negative. No, the 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 I think to me, yeah, the interpreting this W as a structural shocks. Which... From the policy, sorry, from the policymaker point of view, the thought experiment is let me look behind, see what the history until now is, and then decide whether I should go higher or down. Okay. Right, right. I, I right. Like the household or agents in this uh, in this economy, the policy manipulations that policymaker is doing is perceived as a as an unpredictable shock. Okay, 
So, okay, so then one more assumption, which is about uh, how treatments are assigned, policies are assigned in the data, available data. Yeah? So it says, this assumption is sequential uncompounded. It says conditional on history, say up to T minus one, some observable sample T minus one, the policy in time period T is independent, independently assigned, here independent of potential outcomes. Here S runs from T up to cap T. So once you condition on the available history, the current policy is independently assigned here, independent of the underlying potential outcomes today and also the future potential outcomes. So that's basically selection of observable like assumption. So once you condition on this X zero to T minus one, there's no, um, no compounder uh, exists in terms of the assignment of this WT. So that's happening in the available data. So that's assumption. With these assumptions, we can start learning some causal effects yeah, from, the, from the past uh, data. So basically uh, in, in the data, well, here the policymakers today, Policymaker wants to make additions. This policymaker wants to wants to use the data in the past, but policymaker assumes that in the past, past assignment of the policy is somehow randomized to what yeah, to some extent randomized. Yeah, randomized randomized in the in this uh, sequential uncompoundedness. Uh, uh, I mean, in the sense of sequential uncompoundedness. Yeah, some experiments are going on in the past. That's that's what it means. And then today, yeah, sophisticated policy policymaker wants to want to perform addition. So now that let me define the policy of here Prana. So Prana makes decision today and takes the history mapping to either zero or one. And they, this is the objective function of the planner. Planner wants to maximize here, I'm assuming one period welfare, here conditional on the history. So this W cap T, this is a welfare criterion only at the time period T cap T. Yeah? And then here I'm defining conditional expectations of the outcomes yeah, given the available history up to now, yeah, cap T minus one. So this is the potential outcomes. So to, if today's policy is one, so G, if G is selecting policy one today, that today's policy is set to one, yeah. And this is a realized history. So realized policy in the history, yeah. And that's the relevant potential outcome. If the today's policy is set in zero, yeah, then that this is the relevant potential outcome. And then we take expectation. So that's the today, the runners uh, welfare object function. So I have someone has a question. Sorry, sorry, just to clar a quick clarification. Is the functional form of this welfare function important here? Like, must it be this form? Because usually, you know, you people look at different types of quadratic, blah, blah, blah functions. Does, yeah. does that work? Great question. So the the well, as far as the welfare objective has this kind of linear form, summing up some random variables. Maybe you can have a nonlinear transformation of y. And but as far as you are just summing up, that's okay. Uh, yeah. So you, yes, you can have a quadratic of y's and summing up those. As, I mean, that's that's fine. So then the right. Okay. So that's the objective. I mean, welfare. Sorry, welfare objective. The plan ultimately cares. Yeah. So one remark here is that in contrast to the cross-sectional setting. So in the cross-sectional setting. Conditioning, I mean, X is, a, is the individual characteristics. And then for each individual, Prana wants to allocate treatments. But as a whole, in the population, Prana wants to aggregate this individual level welfare. So that means taking expectations with respect to X in the end. That was the reasonable criterion in a the, in the, in the cross-sectional cross -sectional setting. But in the time series setting, the, to us, it, it makes more sense to condition on the particular realization of the history instead of taking average over hypothetical realization of the history. So conditioning on the realized history, Prana cares about today's welfare. Yeah. Extension gonna be, you no, know, we can think about future welfare as well. So in that case, we are going to sum up the welfare for the future. But uh, for now, let's look at the one period welfare criteria. Sorry, Toro. So the function G here 
So it, it's it's a it's constant across time, right? You make a decision on an, an, for an individual, right? You make one decision. Well, the one decision for today. One decision for today. Today, so the planner yeah makes the decisions at the macro level. Decision, just one decision today. Interest rate high or low. But here, using all the available history information. So yes. For for for, for, uh, for in, in the case of uh, employment, right? I mean, can we make a decision like on the same individual across time, like she or he should be treated like have you know taking a course or something like the uh, you know to in the time, or is it uh, like something? That's what I have in mind. Oh, okay, okay. So, so yeah, the we the the so so that there, yeah, there's a type of policy which is you no know, like dynamic assignments. Dynamic assignment is okay. Today's I'm gonna assign these treatments. Next day, that I see the response, and then based upon that, I'm able to switch the treatments, and we keep doing this every time period. So that kind of problem is the the I mean, there's a literature on that, but here we are not yeah. thinking about we are not thinking about that policy choice. Here, policy choice just one shot, one shot today choice today. Okay, okay. okay. But extension is extension is okay. Once we start thinking about future welfare, yeah. And then once we start thinking about dynamic, dynamically adaptive policy, then this G function gonna yeah change over time. In the future okay and i think the, i think in the day not you know if, you, if we have different policies i mean it could be very challenging because you you don't know whether the effect comes from two lags or one lag or you see what i mean if they if you have right. a treatment that changed across the time i think it will be you know quite challenging that's why i'm i'm asking this question yeah thanks yeah 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 thanks. in fact yeah I'm, I'm going to soon assume that some sort of dependence restrictions so so okay. yes that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, next next slide. Okay. So that's a general setting, and uh, but this problem is too complicated because G can be function of entire history. All right. So let's let me make simplifications. Yeah. So first, okay. Let me simplify, and then later I'm going to generalize if time allows. But in the simple setting, actually, we can see the 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 a lot of insights of the problem. So so let me simplify. Let's just focus on the time by, by uh, bivariate time series outcome and the binary WT only. Now I'm going to reduce the dimension potential outcomes by imposing some sort of exclusion restriction we call Markovian exclusion. It says today's uh, time period of T's potential outcome depends only on yesterday's policy and today's policy, but no further past. So this W1 up to T minus one, not T minus two, sorry, T minus two is excluded in this potential outcome. In this way, yeah, we can now reduce the dimension of potential outcomes, basically only just indexed by two policies. That's the first simplification. Second, so this is the Markovian exogeneity. It says, once you just condition on the yesterday's policy, then no other, History informations x1 to t minus one. Okay. Well, sorry, so all the, all the other historical informations is independent of the current potential outcome and the current assignment. Okay. Basically, once you condition on this amount of information w t minus one, basically you can ignore ignore the, all the other past informations. Yeah. So basically, those variables depends only on this w t minus one. That basically that simplifies the statistical dependence over time. But that's a toy example assumption yeah? that the I yeah I, I don't mean this is a characterization of the reality, but the let me make problem as simple as possible to, to, to solve the problem. The third one that's unconfoundedness that means in the data once you just conditioned on the yesterday's policy, today's policy is randomized. The current policy is randomized in this irrespective of the underlying potential outcomes, which this assumption directly follows from the sequential unconfoundedness we imposed. Yeah, uh, and also that, yeah, this additional simplification of So just to give a sense, 
about this dependence of the data. So I'm plotting the causal graph uh, in this uh, evolution of the variables. So yeah, the YT variables depends upon yesterday's policy and today's policy, right? But the basically dependence between YT minus one or WT minus one, YT minus two, dependence of YT and those variables, okay, this dependence disappears once you just fix yesterday's policy. So once you condition on that, yeah, the, all the other past informations okay, is statistically independent in the future. With this simplifications, actually, we can show that the, we can reduce the I mean, dimension of the, of the optimization problem. So this was the originally we wanted to optimize. So conditional on all the history, we want to make a choice. This G, this G can be a function of all the history. But now that under the, this Markovian assumptions, yeah, we can now reduce this policy G as just a function of WT minus one without the loss of welfare. So we can show that optimal policy can only depend upon the yesterday's policy. So this G, the function of G we just want to look at is a very simple function mapping some binary WT minus one to binary WT. So it's now the function space is now very, very small. So, and this becomes the ultimately the objective function we want to, to optimize. Just condition on the WT minus one. Yeah, we want to optimize this objective functions with respect to just a binary G, either one or zero. Okay, so this looks a bit more, more manageable problem. Now, next step is, okay, this is a population welfare criteria, and then we recall that this empirical welfare approach, so we somehow want to construct empirical analog of this, and then optimize empirical analog with respect to policy G. Ah, okay, sorry, before getting there, just to, just to give us, uh, sorry, just to give an example about how our Markovian simple model maps to more like familiar form of structural equation modeling, so here, yeah, we are writing down linear structural equation model, YT, depending upon today and yesterday's policy. And there's also policy equations. So WT is also can depend upon WT minus one. Epsilon T, VT, so these are the structural shocks. And the, the yeah, so Markovian exclusion holds because this YT equations only depends upon these two policies. We can also show Markovian exogeneity holds if the structure shocks are statistically independent of the other time period structure shocks and also the, the, the disability variable in the past. Yeah. A sequential unconfoundedness says basically conditioning on WT minus one is epsilon T and structure shocks, epsilon T and VT, so they are statistically independent. So we can kind of map the, the potential outcome type assumptions into the assumptions about the yeah, structural models in, I mean, in the linear, linear structural models like here. And also, yeah, the since potential outcome framework is very good at dealing with non-stationarity because we allow heterogeneity as a kind of default. In the structural equation world, that means all those structural parameters, okay, these are changing. This can change over time yeah, in an unrestricted way. Okay, so then the, this slides, I'm, just, I'm introducing the empirical analog of the welfare criteria. So here we are showing this historical, so use, sorry, use the historical data to come up with the empirical analog of the today's welfare. So here the, yeah, the, we define this W hat, okay, which is summing up the propensity score weighted outcomes. Here, I'm assuming propensity score is known in the data, but that's not true. So we have to estimate in, the, in, in practice, but here I'm assuming the okay, propensity score is known. Now summing up the propensity score weighted sum of outcomes for time periods over the time periods such that this conditioning information W is the same as the conditioning information we are facing today. Suppose that we are time period type cap T, Yesterday's time, uh, cap time t minus one time period, this w was equal to one. Now look back at the history. 
pick up the time periods where the previous policy was run. So you, you these pick up those time periods, and then under our assumption, policy is reasonably randomized. So that let's now compare the policy equal to one and policy equal to zero case in the history. Compare that. Yeah, I mean, sorry, compare that, and then let's choose the policy today, yeah, which gives higher average. Uh, so we are going to maximize this W hat over G, that G hat, CES. Basically, just look at the history and then just compare that policy one and policy zero. Yeah, and take a difference of it. But here, condition information is basically that, yeah, the hist this W T minus one is basically the same as today. I think that's reasonable. I mean, from the cross-sectional setting, it's a very reasonable kind of extension to time series. Yeah? So that's what our G hat recommendation is. Of course, the question is, does this G hat give you a best policy today? So that's that question, right? So now we, we are going to add some assumptions. Uh, okay, so to do that, right. So let me first set up that this welfare regret at cap time period cap T. This G star is the optimal policy. And now that in order to bound this regret criterion, let me introduce the following object we call W bar. So this W bar is summing up the conditional expectations of the potential outcomes. Well, this conditional expectations is exactly corresponding to the conditional expectation of this object. So this is just random, I mean, random, I mean everything is observed, right? And then the conditional ex, the available history, we can think, define the conditional expectations. Let's think about summing up these such conditional expectations over time. Then, the, then the we get this, this object. Let me look at the difference between this W hat and W bar. This difference between the empirical welfare and the average of the conditional expectations, we can express this difference as some sort of averages of this C random variables. And this C random variable is coming from this propensity score weighted sum of outcome, subtracting its condition expectations. And that this difference, that this C, C variables, which we can, we can see this C variable is conditional mean equal to zero, which is the Martingale difference sequence with respect to the filtration defined through this observable uh, variables. So basically W hat minus W bar, this difference, we can see this as the sum of Martingale difference sequence. So not quite IID, but something, something close, to, close to, to, to the IID. So we can, we can start thinking about bounding, bounding the stochastic and probability, probability distributions for these differences. Okay, sorry. So then there are one more, one more key assumption is we call an invariance of welfare ordering, which says this is a regret, welfare regret of today's policy. But this welfare regret of today's policy can be bounded by the welfare regret in terms of the past, like average of condition expectations. That means, well, okay, well, the, 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 I mean, the, this assumption holds, for instance, if the ranking of the policies between, let's say, G star and G, okay, this ranking is preserved also in the past on average. Basically, from the past history, on average, which policy is better, G star or G? You can learn. You can learn, yeah, from the past his history. So this assumption certainly holds if we assume stationarity of the causal effect. But certainly and substantially weaker than the stationarity of the, of the welfare criteria. Yeah. For instance, in the, we had like this linear structural equation modeling allowing time varying causal effects. Here, the assumption we are imposing is today's causal effects, WT is beta cap T. Yet, sign of this, you can learn from the past averages of the beta T's. This kind of history is giving kind of right answer yeah, for, for today's optimal policy. So that, that's the, the, the assumption, key assumption we are imposing. 
Okay, so then let me put everything together. So if we impose these assumptions, actually WT G star minus WT G hat CS, which is estimated from the data, this welfare regret, you can bound okay, with some inequality, you can bound uh, by two times this constant C. And here, sprema between a uh, sprema of W hat minus W bar and sprema over G. And the W hat minus W bar. So this is like kind of, I mean, this is like a mean zero. You can build this as kind of mean zero empirical process type quantity. But actually, what you are summing up is a MDS, Martingale different sequences, instead of the IID random variables. But the, 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 if you want to bound, yeah, the, the welfare regret, yeah, you're gonna take it. You want to bound the expectation of the premium of this random variables, which is this ultimately you want to bound this quantity. But actually this object, expectation of the sprema of the sum of Martingale different sequences, it bounds up no in the literature. So in a simple case, this freedom and large deviation inequality for the average of MDS, we can apply. And that gives the following bound. So today's welfare regret can be bounded by C over square root T minus one. And this rate is in fact, same as the, what the Chakmansky got for the CES rule. Constants are different, but the rate is the same. So here result is under our assumptions, at least in this Martin, I mean, sorry, Markov, Markov case, I mean, sorry, Markovian, Markovian process with, with the invariance of the welfare ordering assumptions. With these assumptions, we can actually show CS rule can be extended to time series and attain the same convergence. Okay, I think that how many minutes, like, like five, 10 minutes? Kind of. Yeah, you have 10 minutes, so. Uh, okay, 10 minutes. So basically, yeah, that I covered the, the, the simple toy example case. But if we have any questions, I'm happy to. To answer, uh, basically, toy example case basically covers all the important materials in the sense. This assumption is actually, yeah, the, I think it's crucial assumption. But actually, the, this assumption is in fact very weak. Basically, you can we can learn which policy is best from the history, but we still yeah allow many things non stationary Okay, well, then, so then in the paper, yeah, basically we generalize this simple toy example to a uh, more complicated setting. Here, complication arises. Now, yeah, the not only WT minus one, maybe previous YT minus one gonna matter. Maybe there's some other exogenous contextual information that T minus one, that's gonna be used for policy making too. Maybe not only one period of Markovian, we may want to include more time periods in these Markovian structures. So not, not only, one first order Markovian, maybe we want to have a two order uh, Markovian, but but that's basically it. we are having more and more conditioning informations to 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 make additions. So the you know, more complicated setting is right the the yeah the so now the bunch of variables okay, this WR is basically influencing everything yeah so the but but the, we we need some sort of Markovian. The finite order Markovian. Uh, so then the yeah, the, what happens is the now the conditioning information become much, much richer. So we saw extension, I mean transition from CES, Mansky CES to EWM. Now we have rich set of X. We can do some similar extensions from the time series CES now to time series EWM. Challenge is now we have rich set of access. Still, we do care about one period conditional welfare given the history. Yeah. And in the paper, yeah, we derive some conditions such that this time series EWM is going to, uh, so this is a time series EWM type objective function. We, yeah, we have conditions such that time series EWM gives a consistency in terms of the welfare regret. And also we derive some regret bounds but again, same. The idea is same. We try to come up with a the MDS structure of the welfare regret, and then use some 
maximum inequality for, for, the, for the sum of MDS unknown variables. Okay. So in the last maybe three or five minutes, I just want to uh, give uh, some toy empirical example here. Yeah. The, so this, uh, right, so this is an example of the COVID policy. So suppose government has binary treatment, either relaxing the COVID restriction level, W equal to zero or not, W equal to one. Let's set up the policy outcome as the health outcome, let's say minus times two week ahead deaths in the United States. Now government has a, this amount of X uh, information, so XT, sorry, this should be, yeah, well, the could be, yeah, ZT. So yeah, here the, the number of cases, number of deaths, change of cases, change of deaths, restriction level, vaccine coverage, and so on, economic conditions, and so on. Now the government wants to make use of two informations, change of deaths and the restriction level in the previous time period, use these two informations to make additions of whether relax or not the COVID policy. So we get the data from the CDC website. Here the policy is actually continuous, has a continuous variation constructed upon Oxford string jersey index of the COVID containment policy. So this is actually continuous variations. So we are binarizing it by just up or no, so go down, sorry, go down or not. It's more simplicity. Okay, here's the data. Uh, so that's the United States. Uh, and the, this is the number of cases, right? And then this is the number of deaths. So this is the policy index. The high means more, dis more restrictive policy and uh, so on. And the today, well, the policy plan is here today, and I want to make a choice either going down or stay or go up. Okay, so that's there. But well, actually, stay and go up is the same policy, but either go down or not. So that's the policy choice. So this is the economic indicator. So something, yeah, we should note is that okay, this data is quite like non stationary in the sense, okay, there are many things change over time. Maybe virus itself may be changing. And, uh, and here also we kind of, we are making assumption. Oh, okay. Uh, one important assumption is this available data. These policies are randomized to some extent. So, uh, I mean, conditional observable history policy is randomized. Maybe this assumption makes sense given that maybe basically yeah, these are, <laughs> those policy makers have basically no idea how what to do and maybe doing some policy choice only based upon available information without really knowing the, the, how what happens in the future. So, so the, yeah, we could somehow justify the assumption. Now the key, another key assumption, invariance of welfare only. What it means is, okay, we're gonna compare the, you know, the, the outcome, in this case, health outcome uh, between you know, the policy get relaxed or not, and then see how the, then the, we basically take a difference of this average outcome between these two time periods, taking the average over the past history. Now the sign of this okay, remains the same even at today. So that's the, the assumption we are making. Maybe magnitude of effects may be different in the past, but at least the ranking of the policy is preserved over time. With those assumptions, yes, the, now we can apply this time series, the, EWM, yeah. and then the, we get the following policy. So here we only use two axes, difference of the deaths in the previous time period, and the previous policy, I, uh, policy in this policy index. Yeah. And then the, we come up with a, let's get the region. Actually, we are, we are only looking at quadrant policy, meaning this space of G partition is always quadrant, and the threshold becomes this part and this part. So today's poly optimal policy is, right, if the difference in death is above this, sorry, and then below, below this value, yeah, the policy recommendation is uh, W equal to one. W equal to one means, okay, maintain or yeah, 
the, this COVID policy. Otherwise, okay, relax the COVID containment policy, the Hawaii region. Okay, so in the last one minute, I'm just gonna give a quick literature review here. So in microeconometric setting, so there's a growing literature about how to use data to learn policy, uh, but all these existing works are looking at the micro setting, or maybe some sort of panel data setting. In our paper, we are looking at time series setting. So I think that's the, the new the literature. So as I said, okay, in the panel data setting, there's a large literature about dynamic treatment regimes that use basically yeah, a large N and short T yeah, panel setting. Yeah. Also, empirical web maximization is closely related to, I mean, kind of negative version of the risk, right? Welfare is a negative of the risk. So empirical risk minimization and empirical welfare maximization is very similar. Right. Uh, so in the time series setting, yeah, there's some papers discussing empirical risk minimizations in the prediction, prediction setting. Yeah. Our our problem is the causal policy policy choice. So in this sense, yeah, the, the we need a bit more assumptions about how the causal structure yeah, changes over time or preserved over time. We are using the, some techniques and um, a framework, yeah, from this potential outcome time series. So we are building on those literatures, but those literatures are mainly focusing on retrospective evaluation of the policy in the past. Our question is more like choice for today or future. So more like a forward looking uh, problem we are, we are solving. Okay, to finish, so in this paper, we propose a framework for data driven policy choice in the time series setting. So there are a lot of non trivial challenges, which makes, I think, time series setting more interesting than micro setting. So, and there are, I think that there are many, many interesting problems out there. So I hope, uh, yeah, the, the more people start <laughs> working on this. So I welcome, yeah, I welcome many people's uh, interest on that. And uh, right, so we, in this paper, yeah, we, we basically figure out very kind of weak conditions to make sure to, to have this Mansky's rule extendable to time series. Also, if with some additional assumptions, yeah, we show EWM can be extended. This is could be a bit brave statement, but compared with that, you know, some existing like popular ways for policy analysis in macro, when people use structured VAL or maybe DSG approaches, our approach is very, very weak. I mean, has very little specification about functional form, or maybe no research about stationarity except for that for the, this invariance of the welfare ranking. Uh, also, we don't have any prior distribution. So, so basically, the, yeah, since we use potential outcome and time start, uh, potential outcome time series, only talk about assumptions about you know, how that statistical dependence does. So without without specific assumption about functional form. So in this sense, yeah, it's very very different approach. And uh, and I think something interesting question is how our approach can be compared with uh, existing methods of policy choice. Okay, so let me stop here and thanks so much, uh, everyone. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Thor. It was fantastic. Uh, let me stop the recording and then I will open up the floor for any questions.